Okay, welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce, or actually to have here, um, Chris Trovandi, Associate Professor in uh, Statistics and Data Science at the Queensland University of Technology, um, who will talk about improving Bayesian synthetic likelihood via transformation. So thank you, Chris, for being here, and please go ahead. Thanks very much, Massey, for, for that introduction, and also uh, thanks to the organisers for the invitation and for also uh, creating this webinar series. I think it's a really great initiative. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, improving Bayesian synthetic likelihood methods uh, using transformations. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be focusing on how we can improve uh, the computational efficiency and also the flexibility of these methods. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Jacob, David and Scott. So I just wanted to give a special mention to Jacob who's uh, actually leading this work as part of, uh, as part of his, uh, his master's thesis. And he also helped me put uh, these slides together as well. So, so thanks a lot, Jacob. So I'm going to go through the talk and at a couple of times during the presentation, I'm going to stop to see um, if anyone has questions. So I'll just let you know as we go as we go forward to see if there's any questions um, as we go along. So first, first I'm just going to give a bit of a background just to fix the notation. So in Bayesian statistics, we know that we're interested in sampling from the posterior distribution, uh, where theta is the parameter of interest that we're trying to estimate, and y is the data that we've collected. Uh, so this is given by uh, the posterior is proportional to the likelihood function. So this is the likelihood function here. So this is what is implied when we choose a, a particular statistical model. And this term over here is the prior distribution on the parameters. So this encompasses the information about the parameter that we have before we collect the data. So we combine the information from the prior together with the information that we get about the parameter through the likelihood function and this gives us the posterior distribution. Now, in order to generate samples from the posterior distribution using something like a Markov chain Monte Carlo or important sampling methods, we typically need to be able to evaluate the likelihood function uh, as a function of the parameter uh, theta. Now, the types of statistical models that we're going to be interested in this talk uh, are so-called simulator models. So these are also often referred to as implicit models. So with these simulator models, they're a type of stochastic model uh, such that we define a bunch of probabilistic rules and we implement them with compute. And they're used to try to approximate some real life process. So I've got a few examples on the slide here, but obviously uh, we know that there's many more examples in the literature um, across many different disciplines. So one possible example is for modelling the movement patterns of invasive species. Another one is for modelling uh, biological mechanisms. Uh, so for example, uh, collective cell spreading, which are models that are useful for modelling uh, cancer spread. And maybe a third example would be the outbreak of an, of an infectious disease. So taking a really topical example at the moment, uh, COVID-19 COVID would be uh, a nice example of that. Now, with these particular uh, with these particular models, uh, the likelihood function is implicitly defined based on the simulator. Now, unfortunately, the likelihood function for these models is often uh, computationally very expensive, or in some cases, it's completely computationally intractable. But on the other hand, because the way, the way that these models are defined, we can typically generate simulations according to the model. And typically, we can do this quite quickly, at least in comparison to um, how long it might take to compute the likelihood function. So the question then becomes, can we uh, estimate the parameters or estimate the posterior distribution of the parameters based on only the ability to uh, simulate according to the model of interest? Now, probably the most uh, popular method at the moment for doing parameter estimation when we can only generate simulations from the model is a technique called approximate Bayesian computation, or ABC. Now, in ABC, what we do is we prefer parameter values that can generate simulated data from the model that's, uh, in some sense, close to the observed data. 
Now, this measure of closeness is typically based on a, a particular uh, choice of summary statistics, which are believed to be informative about the parameter. Now, there's been some more recent research which has tried to move away from having to uh, select summary statistics, but I still think that there are many applications for which it might be necessary to, uh, to reduce our full data set down to a low dimensional set of summary statistics. Now, given that we've reduced our full data set down to the summary statistics, what we're going to be targeting is not the original posterior anymore. It's actually going to be the posterior distribution of the parameter conditional on the observed value of the summary statistic. So this is often referred to as the, as the partial posterior distribution. So we can already see that there's going to be one source of error in this approximation because our summary statistics typically aren't going to be sufficient statistics. So we're going to lose some kind of information from going down uh, from starting with our full observed data set down to the observed summary statistic. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't really help us at this point because if the original uh, likelihood function was intractable, then so is the summary statistic likelihood. It's also going to be intractable. Now, what ABC does is it estimates this summary statistic likelihood based on simulations. And in particular, we'll see on the next slide that it uses non-parametric methods for, for estimating this likelihood. Now, in the context of ABC, the choice of the summary statistics is typically a trade-off between the information loss and dimensionality. So, as we'll see on the next slide, given that ABC is somewhat of a non-parametric method, uh, we, from, the, from that perspective, we want our summary statistic to be uh, low dimensional. But at the same time, as we reduce the number of, the, the number of summary statistics, we're typically going to be uh, losing more information. So, we have a sort of trade-off between uh, these two aspects. Okay, so this is how we estimate the likelihood in the ABC context. So we propose a parameter value theta uh, in our Bayesian algorithm. So for example, in MCMC or important sampling type methods. Conditional on that theta, we generate N independent and identically distributed data sets according to our statistical model. So we're just going to write our um, independent data sets as X1, X2, up to Xn. And then what we do is for each of these simulated data sets, we compute the corresponding summary statistics. So we end up with this collection of N independent summary statistics. Then we can use these simulated summary statistics in order to estimate the summary statistic likelihood. So this is the expression uh, that, we, that we use for the estimate down here. And so this is actually going to replace the intractable likelihood with an Bayesian algorithm like MCMC or important sampling. Now, there's a few different notations that we need to define um, in this expression. So the first one is the discrepancy function. So this measures the distance between the observed summary statistic and the simulated summary statistic. Uh, the K is, is called the kernel weighting function and it's got a bandwidth parameter given by epsilon. And in the context of ABC, the epsilon is referred to as the ABC tolerance. Now it turns out that there's going to be, uh, the choice of the tolerance is going to be a trade-off between the bias and the variance. Now for people that are familiar with kernel density estimation, we can see that the, the ABC approximation of the likelihood essentially has the same form as a kernel density estimate. So from this perspective, uh, we want the epsilon to be small because that's going to be uh, reducing the bias, which is a good thing. But then at the same time, as we bring the epsilon smaller, we're going to be increasing the variance uh, of this estimator. Now, if the variance is very high, then when we put this into, for example, an MCMC algorithm, then the MCMC algorithm is not going to, is not going to work particularly well. Okay, so that's effectively the ABC approach and no doubt uh, ABC methods have been demonstrated to be extremely useful across many different applications, but they still do have some limitations. Uh, so the first one is that ABC can be quite sensitive to the choice of its tuning parameter, um, in particular the ABC tolerance and also the discrepancy function. Now, even though some research has been conducted on this, I don't think there's any current standard way in order to select these tuning parameters across many different applications. 
And finally, another drawback is that ABC methods suffer from a curse of dimensionality with respect to the dimension of the summer statistic. Um, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, ABC effectively produces a non-parametric estimate of this likelihood. So therefore, from this perspective, we can, we can see why ABC uh, suffers from this curse of dimensionality. Okay, so given that ABC have these limitations, I think it's worthwhile to explore other potential uh, methods for liquid free inference. Uh, so the method that we're going to be focusing on today is one called synthetic likelihood. Now, unlike ABC, which uses a non-parametric approximation of the likelihood, the synthetic likelihood actually uses a parametric approximation of that likelihood. Now, in general, we found that uh, for synthetic likelihood methods, as long as the summary statistic distribution is regular enough so that a parametric approximation is reasonable, we find that it typically scales better to the dimensionality of the summary statistic. And furthermore, it doesn't have as many tuning parameters as compared to ABC. Okay, so this is how we go about uh, approximating the synthetic likelihood. So uh, the first synthetic likelihood pa uh, paper that came out uh, was by Simon Wood in 2010. It was published in Nature. And so what this paper proposes is to, uh, is to approximate the distribution of the model summary statistic with a multivariate normal distribution, where the parameters of that multivariate normal distribution are given by the mean and the covariance matrix. Now, what we do is we allow the mean and the covariance to depend on the parameter of interest. So if we knew what this relationship was, then we can simply just uh, plug these in to the multivariate normal density, and then we could evaluate that density at the observed summary statistic. And this would become our approximation to the summary statistic likelihood. Now, of course, given that we're dealing with really complex models here, uh, we're generally not going to know what the relationship is between uh, the mean and the covariance and the parameter of interest. But what we can do is actually estimate them by simulation. So again, we propose a parameter value theta, for example, in an MCMC algorithm, and then conditional on that parameter generate n IID simulations according to our statistical model. For each of those simulations, we compute the corresponding sum of statistic and then we, what we can do is we can estimate the sample, so we can, we can compute the sample mean and the sample covariance matrix of these collection of, of, collection of summary statistics. And then we can put them into uh, the multivariate normal density. And then we can evaluate this multivariate normal density at the observed value of the summary statistic. Now this here is going to be now our approximation to the summary statistic likelihood which we can then feed into, for example, an MCMC algorithm. So we've actually also considered uh, the Bayesian version of synthetic likelihood. So we considered that in this paper down here. Um, so in that particular case, we're going to get a BSL uh, posterior approximation. So this is our expression down here for that BSL uh, approximation. Now this is going to be uh, the BSL uh, likelihood function, uh, so we can actually approximate, so we can actually estimate unbiasedly uh, this likelihood function by taking our collection of n simulations according to the model, computing the sample mean and the sample covariance, the collection of summary statistics, and then evaluating it at this normal density. So we can see that in the context of uh, Bayesian synthetic likelihood, which we call BSL, the only tuning parameter that we have to specify is the number of simulations that we perform for each model parameter theta that we propose in the MCMC algorithm. Now we've actually found in previous research that the BSL posterior tends to uh, not depend very much on this particular tuning parameter. So therefore we can select it by trying to maximize the computational efficiency. Now, as we increase the number of simulations, we're going to reduce the variance in the synthetic likelihood estimator, which is going to be good because once we pass it into the MCMC algorithm, the MCMC algorithm is going to be more effective. But then at the same time, it's going to, to, it's going to take more time in order to compute that estimate. 
On the other hand, if we decrease the number of simulations, then the time per iteration is going to be smaller, which is good, but that's going to increase the variance of the synthetic likelihood estimator, which is going to adversely affect the performance of the MCMC. So, so we can essentially choose this N in order to uh, try to maximize the computational efficiency. So we found that BSL uh, is, is a very useful method, uh, like, like ABC has shown to be as well. Uh, but it does have some limitations as well. So firstly, uh, the number of simulations that we need uh, also needs to be quite large um, if we've got a large number of summary statistics. Now, the reason for that is we're trying to estimate a high dimensional covariance matrix. And in, 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 in order to estimate this precisely, uh, typically we need to have a large number of simulations. And as we'll see soon, uh, BSL doesn't overcome the curse of dimensionality with respect to the size of the summary statistic. It seems to scale more effectively than ABC, but it certainly doesn't overcome that curse of dimensionality. The second limitation is it relies on the assumption that the distribution of the model summary statistic has roughly a normal distribution. Uh, thirdly, it relies on MCMC to explore the parameter space, and this may not work particularly well if we're, if we're dealing with a high dimensional parameter. And finally, we found that BSL can perform poorly in situations when the model is not able to recover the observed value of the summary statistic. So the poor, the poor performance can be uh, both in terms of uh, not obtaining accurate statistical inferences, and furthermore, it can be computationally inefficient. Now, in some previous research, we've, uh, we've addressed points three and four to, to a certain extent, uh, but unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about those today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on some methods that we developed in order to try to uh, address these two limitations here. Okay, so, so that was the background information. So I think in summary, it's good to have both the ABC and the BSL methods in your, to in your toolbox because uh, typically what I found is that for some applications, ABC seems to work better, uh, but for other applications, it seems that BSL works uh, better. So I think it's quite useful to have uh, both of the methods in the toolbox. Okay, so that's the background information cover. So I think it's a good time now to, uh, to stop to see if anyone has any questions before uh, we move on to sort of the main part of the talk. Okay, so it seems like everyone's sort of understanding what's going on at this point, which is great. So I think um, I think we can move on if the question's there. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're going to uh, talk about methods that we can use to try to address this particular limitation. So how can we uh, decrease the number of simulations that we need from the model, but then also hopefully not decrease the accuracy too much? Okay, so let's have a look at the scaling of the, stand, of, the stand, of, of the standard synthetic likelihood and see why that it doesn't actually scale particularly well to the dimension of the sum of statistic. Okay, so this is our synthetic likelihood here. Uh, so we do the standard approach where we uh, compute the sample mean and the sample covariance based on the end simulations and we plug this into the multivariate normal density. Now, for uh, a large number of simulations and also a high dimensional uh, summary statistic, we've managed to show that the variance of this log synthetic likelihood estimator has this order over here. So by using this result and letting the uh, n be proportional to d squared, uh, we can show that the variance of the log synthetic likelihood is actually of order one. So therefore, if we want to control the variance of the log synthetic likelihood estimator, the number of simulations needs to scale quadratically with the, with the dimension of the summary statistic. So remember that it's important for us to control the variance of the log synthetic likelihood estimator to ensure that the MCMC works uh, quite well. So we can see that uh, the standard BSL approach doesn't scale particularly well to the dimension of the summary statistic. 
Now, the difficult aspect with estimating this synthetic likelihood is that we have to estimate this high dimensional covariance matrix. Um, and so in order to estimate that well, we typically need to generate a large number of model simulations. So therefore, it's worthwhile th thinking about, well, what if we change the covariance matrix in some way to make it easier to estimate? So what we considered uh, was uh, a different synthetic likelihood where instead of having a full covariance matrix, we actually uh, specify a diagonal covariance matrix. So we're going to make the assumption that all of our summary statistics are uncorrelated. So now based on this assumption, let's see if it's somehow now easier to, uh, from a computational point of view, easier now to estimate this synthetic likelihood. So it turns out that it is. So again, for a large N and D, we can show that the variance of the log synthetic likelihood, this uh, alternative one, um, has this order over here. And using this result and letting N be proportional to D, uh, we can actually show that the variance of the log synthetic likelihood is of order one. So therefore, in order to control the variance of this estimator, we only need the number of, number of model simulations to grow linearly as we increase the dimension of the summer statistic. And this is in contrast to uh, the standard synthetic likelihood where we need to scale the, uh, the number of model simulations as D squared. So therefore, we can see that with BSL, we can make uh, significant computational benefits by uh, having some statistics that are uncorrelated. Now, of course, in practice, it's going to be very difficult to find some statistics that are uncorrelated in the first place. So that's going to be very hard to do. Um, and so the solution that we propose is to use something called a widening transformation within Bayesian synthetic likelihood. And so what the whitening transformation does is it actually decorrelates our statistics. And so therefore, um, hopefully, uh, we can uh, try to exploit uh, these potential computational benefits. Now, before I go into the whitening transformation aspect, firstly, I'm going to talk about shrinkage covariance matrix estimation. So the particular uh, covariance matrix estimator that we've used in the past is this one due to Wharton. So what we do here is that we decompose our covariance matrix into a, uh, diag a diagonal matrix, which consists of the variances on the diagonals and also the correlation matrix R. So what we do is we estimate our correlation matrix and then we shrink that correlation matrix closer to the identity. And then we recombine uh, this new correlation matrix with the uh, original uh, variances of those summary statistics. Now, the good thing about using the shrinkage estimator is that we can uh, reduce the number of model simulations that we need in order to obtain uh, an estimate of the covariance matrix that has a smaller variance. And so this means that uh, we can reduce the number of model simulations without adversely affecting the MCE. Now, we've found this approach to work quite well when there's a low degree of correlation between the summary statistics. But of course, when there's a high degree of correlation between the summary statistics, then uh, using this approach can lead to uh, poor approximations of the BSL posterior. So the solution that we've proposed here is to use a whitening transformation. Uh, so this is the whitening transformation here. Uh, so the W here, that's referred to as the whitening matrix. Now, what the whitening transformation does is it takes uh, a random vector that has a variance, uh, a covariance given by sigma, and it transforms it to another random vector, S tilde, which actually has uh, as the covariance, it's given by the identity matrix. Now, what we do in the context of BSL is that we uh, firstly estimate this W based on some initial value of the parameter theta naught. Now, this initial parameter value might come from um, expert knowledge, or it might come from, uh, say, pilot runs of, of, a, of a likelihood-free algorithm. So now that we have this W, we perform this transformation, and then we use that same transformation matrix across all values for the parameter. So therefore, this winding matrix is going to decorrelate at the parameter theta naught, but it's only going to approximately decorrelate for other values uh, for the parameter. 
So the main idea behind this method is that we're trying to decorrelate the summary statistics so we can apply a much heavier shrinkage in this uh, covariance matrix estimation method here. And so we can do that to reduce the number of model simulations, but hopefully not uh, decrease the accuracy of the approximation so much. Now it turns out that there's an infinitely many number of these W matrices that can decorrelate our summary statistics. So the, the particular W that we're interested in is going to be the, the one that's going to be quite effective at decorrelating the summary statistics for, for different values of theta away from the theta norm. So we've played around uh, with quite a few different uh, winding transformations, but the one that we found to be most effective in the BSL context is this method called PCA whitening. Now what we do here is that we perform the eigen decomposition of our covariance matrix and then we set the whitening matrix to be uh, this expression over here. So the results I'm going to present uh, today are going to be results just using this PCA uh, whitening method but if you want to have a look at the other different whitening approaches um, they're all uh, in, the, in the archive paper that I'll show at the end. Okay, so now we're going to look at a couple of examples to see how effective this whitening BSL approach can be. Uh, so the first example that we're going to consider is a very simple example. It's simply just a, a moving average of order two model. Uh, so this, uh, this particular model evolves according to uh, this stochastic process down here, where we've got the two parameters, the theta one and the theta two. Now we're going to make the assumption that the observed data is actually just a simulated data set where the true value of the parameter is given by uh, 0.6 and 0.2. And we're going to generate 200 observations. And we're going to take our summary statistic as the full data set. So therefore, in this particular case, we have a uh, 200 dimensional summary statistic. And this is very large in, in the context of, uh, of likelihood free methods. Okay, so here's some results that we that we get. So on the left hand side, uh, we've got the uh, BSL using the standard uh, shrinkage estimator, the Wharton shrinkage estimator. And then on the right hand side, we've got PCA whiten whitening plus the, uh, plus the shrinkage estimation. Um, so for this particular case, we can compute the likelihood function. So therefore we can get the tree posterior. So the tree posterior is the one shown back and then and then the coloured one is the approximation that we get. So we see that with the Wharton shrinkage, when we don't apply too much shrinkage, so that shrinkage parameter is pretty close to one, so that's saying that we haven't applied much shrinkage, uh, we can see that we can get a reasonable um, approximation of the posterior. Uh, but we'll notice that we've, we've had to generate quite a large number of simulations there. So for every parameter value that we propose, we need to generate 5,000 simulations from our statistical model. So therefore, we, we really want to reduce the number of model simulations that we have to do. So we can do that by applying more shrinkage. So by applying full shrinkage, so we're only estimating a diagonal matrix here, we only need to have uh, roughly 200 simulations in order to control the variance. But as we can see, even though we've uh, redu massively reduced the computation we have to do, we, we've ended up with, with this really poor um, approximation of the actual posterior. So this is, this is a really bad approximation. But as we go to the right hand side, when we also include the winding transformation, we can see that with a very small amount of shrinkage, we're getting a very, very good approximation. But again, this is using um, 5,000 simulations from our model. So in order to reduce the number of simulations, we can apply more shrinkage. So we've managed to massively reduce the number of simulations by down to about 200. And we can see that even though uh, we're doing so many less model simulations, we're actually getting quite a reasonable approximation uh, to the posterior. So we can see that the, the PCA winding has been very effective in decorrelating um, these summary statistics ac across, um, across the, the sort of uh, non-negligible non uh, parts of the parameter space.
Okay, so that was a relatively simple example. Let's move on to a more complex one, or in particular, a more realistic one. Now, uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't actually remember all the details of this particular model, so I'm just going to go through uh, a few of the details, but hopefully it's enough to understand what's going on. So we're going to consider uh, the stochastic process that was proposed in this paper. And so this is a model that's uh, describing the individual based uh, movement of a species of, uh, of a particular toad. So this paper actually proposed, I think, three different models. Uh, we're just going to focus on one of those particular models, which is referred to as the random return model. Now, the model assumes that the toad is going to, uh, is going to sleep during the day and it's going to try to eat uh, during the night. Uh, and it's also going to make the assumption that the displacement of the toad is going to be drawn from an alpha stable distribution uh, that's rolled by these two parameters here. And we're also going to make the assumption that the toad is going to return to, uh, to, their, uh, to their foraging site with a probability given by P0. And the actual site that we're going to choose um, is going to be selected randomly based on the previous refuge sites that uh, that the toad has visited. So we can see that for, for this particular model, we've got these uh, three parameters, and they're all unknown parameters. So we need to we need to try to estimate these parameters. So for our data set, it's actually going to be a matrix of displacements of of dimension 66 by uh, 63. So we've got 66 toads, and we have 63 days. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to apply initial summarization of this data set. So we're going to summarize it down to four sets. That's going to consist of the moving distances for time lags of one, two, four, and eight days. So that's the initial summarization. So we're actually going to further summarize this. So firstly, we're going to uh, consider the number of returns for all the four time lags. So if the, if the distance is less than 10, we're going to make the assumption um, we're going to make the assumption that the toad has returned. And then for the non-returns, we're going to consider the log difference between adjacent p quantiles and taking these p values here. And we're also going to include the median in this. And for both cases, we're going to repeat this process for the time lags of one, two, four, and eight days. So if we combine all of those summary statistics together, we're going to end up uh, with 48 summary statistics. So obviously this is not as high dimensional as the previous example, but still this is uh, quite high dimensional uh, with respect to uh, likelihood free methods. So here we're going to be using a simulated data set as the, as the observed data set, so we know what the true value of the parameter is. Okay, so these are the results that we get. So on the top, we have the, there's just the standard uh, Wharton shrinkage. And then on the bottom, we have the whitening plus the shrinkage. Now in this particular case, we have, uh, we have three parameters. So this means we're going to have three bivariate plots for each particular method. And given that the normal assumption is quite reasonable for this example, we're going to take the BSL approximation as the gold standard. So obviously for this particular case, we can't actually obtain the true posterior distribution. So they're going to try to get as close to the BSL approximation as we can, and also trying to reduce the number of model simulations that we need. So firstly, for the Wharton case, when we apply full shrinkage, we're able to uh, to massively reduce the number of model simulations that we need in order to control the variance of the synthetic likelihood. But as we can see, uh, that this particular approximation is not particularly close to the BSL approximation. On the other hand, when we include the winding transformation and do full shrinkage, we're able to again massively reduce the number of simulations that we have to do. And, and also in this case, you can see that we're actually getting a pretty accurate um, approximation of the BSL posterior. Okay, so that actually brings us to the end of that part of the talk. So that was about how can we uh, how can we reduce the number of model simulations that we have to do. So now I'm going to go on to the onto the next part, which is trying to um, increase the flexibility of the approach. 
Um, so I think at this point I'd like to stop just to see if there's any questions about uh, the whitening transformation BSL work. Yeah, go for it, Michael. Okay, I, I have a question on, on slide 12, I think, where you had like the variance as a function of n and d. Um, let's navigate there, perhaps. Uh, here, yeah. Um, so if you fix n and just let d grow, this would mean the variance grows less like 1 over d which would mean then that it goes to zero as d goes up. Um, how how do, should we understand that? Does that mean that it's a huge bias and we have zero variance or? Um, so if we, so, so what did you say? So if we fix n and we let d increase, yeah. right? okay, this is so right. in, in that case, the variance should should get bigger. Well, don't we have here like one over d squared then? If n is fixed, because we have d over something d to the power of three. So we should have then here variance is O of one over d squared. Um, so I might need to think about that. Think about that a bit more, but it should it should be the case that if you if you uh, fix n and you increase d, then actually the variance should should get bigger and bigger. Okay. So I this think, is yeah. you know, as you increase d, if you want to control the variance, you have to also increase n. Okay. I think David uh, chipped in and he says like um, we we can't hold on uh, hold n fixed. Yeah. So you you can't just fix one or the other. He says okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, maybe another question. So on the on the uh, oh, well, actually, there's a, there's another question in the chat. So I, I should give give the floor to to Christian and Patrick. Um, can you see the chat, David? Uh, uh, Chris, sorry. Um, yeah. So. Um... So there's one question from Christian. Assuming the samples along the MCMC chain are close correlated, could one perform PCA every D steps to update the whitening, to update the whitening matrix? Um, yeah. So this is this is a really interesting this is a really interesting su suggestion. So um, ideally, we would like to sort of um, uh, produce a different whitening transformation for every different parameter because we'd like to decorrelate the summer statistics over the complete parameter space. Um, so the reason, so the reason that we uh, that we chose to do it um, this way, where we just have a fixed uh, whitening matrix, I guess there's two reasons for that. Um, the first is, I guess, for computational reasons, because um, in order to estimate this uh, whitening matrix, then we typically use quite a large number of model simulations. Um, so we only do this once at the initial parameter value. Um, so therefore, it's it's a it's a small cost before you run the NCMC. So if we were try to to try to sort of like do this for lots of different parameter values, then the computational cost is going to grow. So that was one that was one issue. Um, I guess the second issue is that uh, we're not sure theoretically what's going to happen to the NCMC if we keep changing the whitening matrix as we go along. So I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if there's going to be a well-defined target distribution in that particular case. I mean, there might be, but I think the theory that you'd have to do would be a lot more extensive um, than what we have. So I mean, given that you've only got a single W, it's quite obvious that um, that you're still going to have a well-defined uh, target distribution with the NCMC. So I guess they're the two main reasons. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that's a reasonable answer to the question. Uh, so uh, Patrick's question is, is it significant that gamma is set to zero in most examples? Um, yes, yeah, so that's definitely significant because when the gamma is set to zero, it means that we're doing full shrinkage. So going back over here, if the gamma is equal to zero, 
we can see that the uh, that what, what we're going to be estimating for the covariance matrix is always going to be a diagonal covariance matrix. So if, if we make this assumption, then we can reduce the number of model simulations that we need in order to control uh, the variance of the synthetic likelihood. So for computational reasons, we want to take the gamma as small as possible. But as we saw before, just with the standard approach, if you take your gamma too small, you're going to end up with a with a worse approximation of the posterior. But as we saw just before, the widening transformation can really help um, improve that approximation and also allow you to do really heavy shrinkage in order to uh, reduce the number of model simulations. Okay, so hopefully that's okay. So I think at this point it might be good to uh, move on to the last part of the talk just to make sure I've got enough time to cover that. Okay, so the first part of the talk there was trying to address the limitation of the number of model simulations. And so now we're going to try to in improve the flexibility of, of BSL. Now we've actually done some research on this in the past and we created a method called semi-BSL in order to uh, try to um, improve the robustness to the, to the Gaussian assumption. So what we do here is that we estimate the marginal distribution of each summer statistic using kernel density estimation. So taking our N simulations, for each of the individual summer statistics, we can estimate the marginal distribution simply just using this kernel density estimator. And then what we do in order to, uh, in order to account for the dependent structure between the summary statistics is we use a Gaussian copula. So what we do here is we take our observed summary statistic and we pass it through the CDF of those individual uh, marginal distributions in order to create these U's. So if the kernel density estimate fits pretty well, then these U's should have, uh, should have approximately a uniform distribution. And then when we pass this, uh, this value through the inverse CDF of the standard normal distribution, we're going to get this eta. Now, if everything has worked quite well, then the eta should have uh, roughly a standard normal distribution. Now, the only parameter that we have within this copular density is this correlation matrix. So what we can do is we can uh, estimate that correlation matrix using our collection of summary statistics and also passing them through these individual transformations. Now, once we've estimated both the marginal distributions and also the copula, we can uh, estimate the, the full summary statistic likelihood using this expression over here. So over here, we've got, the, um, we've got the marginal kernel density estimates for each of those individual summary statistics. And then over here, we have uh, the copula density that's, account, that's trying to account for the uh, potential dependent structure between these summary statistics. Now, we found this method to work reasonably well, but we've also encountered other examples that have very heavy tails. Uh, so for these particular cases, we found that standard kernel density estimation actually doesn't work particularly well. And the reason why it doesn't work very well is it makes a global bandwidth assumption. So it assumes the same kind of smoothing across the full density, which may not be appropriate, particularly when you have heavy tails. So what we propose to overcome this is a, is a method um, previously proposed in the literature called uh, transformation kernel density estimation. So the idea of this is to firstly transform our density to something that's a bit more regular and then apply a kernel estimate to that transform density and then transform back to the original space. Uh, so this is the um, this is the particular transformation that we've used in our work. So we've found that this uh, that this transformation works quite well in terms of trying to transform our density to uh, to a standard normal distribution. Because if we can transform the original density to a standard normal distribution, then the kernel density estimator is actually uh, going to work quite well. So given that I don't seem to have a lot of time left, I'm not going to go through all the details here. Um, so something that we also do is that we apply an initial log transformation when we have a very uh, a very irregular um, a very irregular distribution, and this seems to help uh, try to sort of regularize the distribution a little bit, and then we apply that transformation. 
Okay, so this is, a, this is a visualization of the process on some different test densities. So we've got six uh, different test densities. And if you, if you can see the black uh, densities down here, so they're the true densities. So in the top row, we have uh, a histogram of samples generated from that density. On the second row, we apply the initial log transformation. Um, so we can see that for some of these distributions, it's managed to uh, sort of uh, make it a bit less heavy tail, which is which is good. And then on the third row, we apply the transformation from the previous slide. So that's um, this transformation here. And the objective of that transformation is to try to transform to a standard normal distribution. So we can see from the colored plots here that it's actually done a pretty good job in uh, transforming to the standard normal distribution. But in some cases, we can see that it hasn't, um, it hasn't fully um, taken us to a standard normal distribution. So then to try to account for that, then we approximate this with a kernel density estimate. And then once we've done that, we back transform to the, to the original parameterization. And so we can see that we can get some really good uh, approximations to these densities. And we can see that um, some of these densities are very complicated. So we have ones with very heavy skewness. We have densities with very heavy ketosis and even a bimodal distribution. So, it, so we've managed to see that this um, transformation KDE approach has really helped us to uh, try to estimate these very challenging marginal densities. And this is the comparison with kernel density estimation. So we can see that for a, a very small number of uh, simulations, uh, we can see that the TKDE approach can give us a much better estimate of the density compared to just the standard kernel density estimator. Okay, so the basic idea is to simply just use this transformation KDE within the semi-BSL approach as opposed to the original kernel density estimate. Um, so we looked at this particular example here. So this is a, a, a state space model. Um, so this is the transition density. And this one over here is the observation equation. So we're making the assumption that we're drawing these Vs from, uh, from a stable distribution uh, that's parameterized with these um, um, parameters here. So we're going to make the assumption that we know most of these parameters and we're going to let these two parameters um, be unknown and we're going to try and estimate those parameters. So for the, uh, for the observed summary statistic, we're going to generate a simulation from our model based on these two different parameter configurations and we're going to consider 50 observations. So here we have uh, 50 summary statistics. Okay, so these are the results that we get for those two different data sets. So we have uh, the first data set along the, along the top row. So the one, this one over here is, uh, is a plot of the marginal distribution for one of these summary statistics. So we can see that the marginal distribution is quite complicated. But even though it's quite complicated, uh, we can see that the standard semi-BSL approach actually does quite well. Uh, so the, the results that we get for the TKDE and the KDE semi-BSL are actually um, quite similar in this case. But once we go to this data set down here where the marginal distribution is even uh, more irregular, so we can see that the, that the skewness, uh, the heavy tail is, is, is growing for this particular data set. In this case, we found that the semi-BSL approach pretty much failed completely. So the acceptance rate was very small. So even with a very large number of model simulations, the acceptance rate of the MCMC was very small. So we didn't get um, a very good approximation in this case, whereas for the TKDE approach, we managed to get um, some sensible posterior distributions coming out. Okay, so now we're talking about two aspects. We've we've used whitening in order to uh, in in order to increase the computational efficiency, and secondly, we've used transformation KDE in order to improve the improve the the flexibility. But can we uh, can we uh, at the same time can we improve the computational efficiency and also improve the flexibility? And the answer to that question is yes. So we can certainly combine um, these two methods together. Now, for the whitening in the context of the semi-BSL, we actually apply the whitening uh, matrix to, uh, to these uh, Gaussian quantiles. So, that, so this is from uh, the gaussian copula equation. Um, so we can incorporate that with semi-BSL um, using 
for example, just the standard kernel density estimate, but we can also combine it with the transformation KDE as well. Okay, so these are some results that we get for the MA2 example. Um, so we took the MA2 example from the previous slide and simply just um, put in some artificial marginal distributions there. Um, so in this particular case, we managed to get good results just with the standard semi-BSL. Um, by including the whitening in there, we've managed to reduce the number of model simulations and also not uh, decrease the accuracy too much. And we can also see that the semi-BSL works quite well with transformation, kernel density estimation, and also uh, including the, uh, the whitening transformation in there. So one thing that we have noticed is that the more irregular the summary statistic distribution is, the less we seem to gain by, uh, by trying to reduce the, models, the number of model simulations. So we can see in this particular case, we've only managed to go from 700 model simulations down to 200 model simulations. So this is still reasonable, but it's certainly not as significant as what we got with the, with the regular BSL. So I just wanted to mention quickly that we have an evolving R package for these BSL methods. So uh, for some of the BSL methods I've spoken about today, but also some other B BSL methods that we've worked on in other papers. So we still yet to incorporate uh, the transformation KDE into that package, but hopefully we can, we can do that soon. Now, just to finish off with some uh, limitations and future work. Uh, so I guess one of the limitations of this approach is that the efficiency gains of the whitening seems to be dampened by, uh, by the increasing irregularity of the, of the marginal distributions of the summary statistics. So that was certainly a limitation. And I guess another limitation is that we're only able to handle non-Gaussian marginal distributions. So what if we have you know, some kind of non-linear dependent structure between our summary statistics? Because with the Gaussian copula, we're still making the assumption that the dependent structure after the transformation can be approximated pretty well with it with a Gaussian dependent structure. So for future work, we'd like to be able to uh, use even more flexible transformations in order to account uh, for say nonlinear dependence between, uh, between the summer statistics. Okay, so the, the work that I've spoken about today is based on uh, these two papers. Uh, so this first paper is, is already on archive and we're currently preparing the second paper, and hopefully that should be on archive soon. Um, so that's all, that's all I wanted to say, so thanks very much, everyone. Uh, thanks, Chris, um, for the great talk. Um, any questions? Well, I guess we've had uh, we've had the questions during this talk, so maybe there's <laughs> there's no more questions remaining. Okay. Or, or people are still clapping. So, so maybe <laughs> while people are clapping, um, a, a quick question to to clarify. So the uh, the KDE, um, do do you have to run it in uh, in each step of of the algorithm? So whenever you change theta and you get new summary statistics, you recompute the the KDE. Is is that correct? Yeah, that's that's um, yeah, that's definitely correct. Um, so, I guess I guess it's a little bit slower than standard BSL because you have to do that. But in applications where the model simulation takes quite a bit of time, then then you don't actually really notice that additional computation. Um, on top of that, the transformation KD is a bit slower because at every iteration we need to. Um, Let me try to go back to the slide. So this one's also a bit slower because we need to estimate these parameters as well. Um, but we find that this is also very fast. So as long as we're looking at complex examples so that the, that the model simulation really dominates the cost of the total algorithm, you don't really sort of notice this, um, this additional computation. 
Okay, yeah, makes makes sense. So there's some kind of trade-off there. No. Um, any other questions, perhaps? Well, maybe I, I have the mic, so I can actually ask one more if if, if I'm allowed. Um, so. Is there a way to choose n before you see somehow the the final result, so that somehow um, you you know that you can spot that you chose n too small and and things won't won't work? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So uh, we sort of found that so if you have um, if you've got some kind of point estimate of your parameter, some kind of reasonable point estimate then what you can do is run simulations of that particular point. And what you want to try and do is choose the n so that the variance of the, the log of the synthetic likelihood estimator is roughly between one and two. So it's the so the guidance for choosing, choosing n is actually very similar to the guidance that you would um, obtain in pseudo marginal MCMC. So if your standard deviation is too small, like so for example, something less than one, it probably tells you you've chosen your n to be too large, whereas if your if your standard deviation is is above, say, you know, two or three, then it probably tells you that the n is too small. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and so so you choose a test point, and perhaps one, one could then um, just uh, like make it stochastically from time to time to just check that actually the chosen n is still fine so that you could adapt a little bit on, on the fly if if you happen to end yeah, yeah i think i think it i think it, yeah that's a very good that's a very good point so i think it would be possible to develop some kind of um adaptive version of this algorithm that's that's not something that that we've actually done but i think but i think that might that might be um that might be a good suggestion Okay, that's that's all my questions for now. And uh, unless there are any from further ones from the audience, we may uh, thank the, the speaker again. Some uh, clapping, and then uh, the next talk is in in two weeks' time. Um, thanks again for, well, for attending. Well, there was actually sorry sorry to interrupt. You. There is uh, one more question in the chat. Ah, thanks. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. that. Is that from Christian? So it says, could you use the Harold Davis estimator in place of the KDE? Um, so I've actually, I've actually never heard of the Harris Davis estimator, but technically speaking, technically speaking, I'm pretty sure that you could use any any density estimator um, in place of the KDE. So we we played around just with the standard one and also this transformation one, but you'd imagine that. It would be. It should be possible to incorporate um, any uh, any uh, density estimator within within semi BSL. And I know that there's a very vast literature on on kernel density estimation and gen density estimation in general. Okay, so I think this was then uh, the last question. Um, thanks again, uh, uh, Chris, for for the great talk. No, thanks a lot, Michael, and thanks uh, thanks everyone for for tuning in. It was really great to it was really great to um, give this presentation to everyone.